name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. There seems to be a recognizable difference, both in the scriptures and in real life, between catching fish and feeding sheep. Peter was a born fisherman. His ancestors had for many generations perfected the art of fishing in that lake of Galilee. And the great fisherman seems to have been a successful fisherman. Then one day, the son of a carpenter passed by, commanded him to leave his net and follow him. It was a command which Peter never fully understood, but could not resist. For some three years now, he had rarely gone fishing. He walked around with this strangely fascinating master, many years younger than himself. There was joy in following him, but also perplexity, unpredictability. Then suddenly one day, the master was gone. Of course, there were those strange appearances of the master, but one was not quite sure what to make of all those appearances. Hope unkindled, gloom spreading its shadow of vague disquiet. Peter, like many of us, decided to do something about it. The one thing he knew well, I go a fishing. And there were six others who said, we come with. But it was a frustrating experience. There were those seven fishermen in one boat, fishing all night with all their skills, <coughs> but catching nothing. That night, they caught nothing. Now, the 21st chapter of the fourth gospel may have some reference to some historical event in the life of the apostolic community. But it cannot be understood as an objective account of a historical event. It speaks a language a little obscure to our modern ears, which are out of touch with the transcendent and evocative use of language. But the meaning is there for us to appropriate. The 21st chapter is a kind of capsule form of the Book of Acts <coughs> in the corpus of Johannian literature. It is a different account of the success story of the Holy Spirit so well described by the author of Acts. It describes also, however, unlike Luke, that dark night of the soul in the life of the early church, when for the first decade at least after the resurrection, the church had no brilliant successes. They toiled all night and caught nothing. No fish caught, seven qualified apostles toiling, very much our own experience in the 20th century. Tremendous amount of toil, the magnificent organizations in the church, the vast number of forces which we have recruited and trained and sent into the field, and what do we have to show for our toil? <coughs> well, here we are, the seaweed and the crabs that have been caught in this net. <laughs> then suddenly, there is a figure in silhouette on the seashore. One cannot quite recognize him. It's twilight. The night fades. The dawn breaks. 
And then that figure approaches and asks a very embarrassing question. Children, have you any fish? And the usually voluble Peter, who is never short of words, like most of us, has a very brief answer. No. And it is a question which the master who appears in silhouette on our horizon asks of the church today. Children, have you any fish, really? And our answer has to be, if we are honest, a brief no. But of course we wouldn't give that answer. We would like to qualify our answer, being academic people, by not giving inaccurate negatives or positives, but with all kinds of qualities. Yes, we do have a certain amount of fish, though there may be some question about the quality of the fish and whether they really <laughs> belong to the species. Then, this figure in silhouette, whom people begin to recognize as the son of a carpenter, not a professional fisherman at all, tells the professional fisherman, cast your net on the other side of the ship. And Peter, the experienced missionary, with centuries of accumulated knowledge of missionary strategy and technique, with a subdued mutter, saying, oh, well, we'll do it, if you want. And then, the unpredictable happens, as usual. And you cannot drag in the fish that you catch. 153 large fish. That seems to have been the number of the varieties of fish in the Mediterranean Ocean, according to Aristotelian biology. And they were all in the net, and the net wasn't torn yet. <coughs> but then, the master does something. When the disciples approach him, with their statement that they have no fish, he already has some fish being charcoal broiled <coughs> on the seashore. And there it is, the fish and the bread, the fish and the bread, in the place of wine, in the place of the blood of Christ, is fish on the charcoal fire fish, that's you and me. And then he says, bring some of the fish which you have now caught. Then he puts, along with the old fish who were already broiling there, some of the new fish. And then he feeds the church. That is the way the church grows. There is a continuous process by which this charcoal fire, which could be seen either as persecution or as opposition, has to broil at least some of the fish so that the whole community may be fed. And when we come to the Eucharist, when we come to the Holy Communion, when we come to the Lord's table, that is one thing we have to remember that coming to the table is a very dangerous thing. It may mean that you too may be called upon to be put in the charcoal fire in order that the church may be fed. Let me just make three brief points which come out of this passage. Ten years ago, <laughs> Twelve years ago, when I was in this country, I looked at the churches in this country, full, packed full, 
I've spent a great deal of time with university students in this country who came to chapel, who had no great opposition to Christianity, but no great interest in it either. But again and again, one felt there was nothing burning there. And then came the civil rights issue. Then came the casualties. Then came the people who had to be burned in the fire. And there were a few Christians who were placed in the charcoal fire. And then the church came alive. Perhaps not the whole of it. But this is true throughout the history of the Christian church. It's only when some members of the body of Christ are roasted in the fire of opposition and persecution that the whole church comes alive. And today, once again, all over the world, this challenge is before us. Are we prepared to be placed in the charcoal fire of the world's opposition, <coughs> of the tremendous residual powers of the principalities and powers that be in this world to still oppose a campaign for justice and the dignity of men. If anybody says, as some of my colleagues do, that the principalities and powers have been broken down and beaten by Christ and all we have to do is to go and occupy the territory, we're making a big mistake. The principalities and powers are still unwilling to give up. They are there. And they will not go away just by your going and walking with confidence and ridiculing them. No. You will have to pay the price of your blood that the principalities and powers can be broken down. The structures of injustice in the world <coughs> against which some of us have knocked our heads more than once, are much too strong. And the church must be realistic enough to recognize this and count the cost of taking a stand. The second point, which may be more difficult for you to accept, comes from the latter part of the lesson. Here was this expert fisherman who had been taught a lesson about fishing. And then our Lord calls him aside and tells him a few, asks him a few embarrassing questions which seem to be rather pointless. But again and again, if you read that passage over and over again, the point comes through. My dear Simon, you think you are an expert fisherman, but that is not the vocation I have chosen for you. I want you to be a shepherd to feed sheep. And as I began by saying, there is a distinction between catching fish and feeding sheep. And I would like to suggest that the time has come for the church to shift from the emphasis on catching fish to a fresh emphasis on feeding sheep. We have talked about mission for a long time. We have been afraid of introversion and navel-gazing in the church. We have been afraid of pietism and we have pled for extroversion and activism. The result has been, in the end, on the one hand, there has been so much talkativeness that the world, as well as Christians themselves, are disgusted of more talk. If mission means talking, then that kind of mission has had its heyday, it would help us very much 
if we learn to remain silent and to be humble. On the other hand, mission has now become something else. It's no longer so much talking, of course, we do make great declarations about political issues as part of our church's talking task. But most of our task now ha happens to be doing exactly what everybody else does. If in the international sphere aid is the important thing, then the churches become aid agencies. Their mission takes on the form of whatever the successful international or national agencies in the world are doing. We join the bandwagon of the church, of the, of the world, and try to do in much poorer way what the world is already doing. Technical assistance, nation building, development, all the rest. And we put our mission into that. And I wish to suggest that we need to have a fresh image if we have to recover the authenticity of the life of the church. And I wish to suggest to you this image of feeding the sheep. And my third point is just to give a little content to that image. What does it mean to feed the sheep? Does it mean that pastors become wet nurses to their congregations, nurturing them with the milk of the word? No, that is not what I have in mind. What I mean by a pastoral community is nothing less than the image which our Lord applied to himself, that of the Good Shepherd. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd knows his sheep by name, as the 10th chapter of John says. He calls them out. He walks before them. And when the wolf comes, he does not flee. The hireling fleeth, but the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. This is the image that I have in mind. The church and the universal church, the worldwide church, has to become this kind of a good shepherd to the whole human race. I'm not speaking of a pastoral community in narrow terms of the congregation, but in terms of humanity. The church has to become a pastoral community that knows the world by its name, that knows it well enough that when it speaks, it is listened to, because it speaks not the language of an abstract theology, but the language of life, because it speaks with an authenticity which the world can trust, which is neither hypocritical nor empty. It speaks with expertise and knowledge about what is going on in the world. And then it has always this task of pioneering, going before the sheep. And that is what calls for imagination and creativity. To know what a situation is and then to move forward along with the sheep, ahead of them, but with them. In new experiments, pioneering, in order that the sheep may find pasture, in order that humanity may live. But lest this image of the Good Shepherd become too romantically pastoral, walking beside the still waters and the green pastures in romantic peace and comfort. The Lord says already, when the shepherd walks forward, the wolves come. 
And you can be sure that if your pioneering is of any significance, the wolves will come. You don't have to howl for them. But the point is, to have the strength and the courage to stand when the wolf comes and not to flee. And in the process of standing, maybe to lay down your life for the sheep. This is the vocation to which Peter was called. And he said, you think you are an expert in catching fish. For the time being, you give that up. I have other people. I'm just getting a man called Saul of Tarsus ready to do that job. But you, you've got a different job, that of feeding sheep. So when we come to this table of the Lord, let us remember these things. To come to the table of the Lord means to lay our lives open to being placed on the charcoal fire. To come to the Lord's table means perhaps to be given a commission which is not exactly that which accords with our competence or our supposed competence. He may send us to a task which we think we have not the adequate equipment for, but precisely in accepting that pioneering task, you will find that the competence that you think you do not have will come to you as you begin to understand the name of the sheep and call them by name and walk ahead of them. And as the wolves begin to come, the competence will develop. It will not be a simple success story. The story of the church will always have to be a story of laying down its life, not of becoming the obviously relevant redeemer of humanity, but through its apparent failures, through the laying down of the lives of some of its members, through unexpected ways, he who stands on the seashore in a silhouette form will see to it that the mankind for which he has died will be saved. Our task is to follow him.